What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Scalability Podcast. And today, I got my friend Tomas Ovalle. 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 Sorry, I, 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 right. I messed that up. <laughs> Welcome to the Scalability Podcast, your go-to resource for those who want to profitably grow their business and life beyond the limits of your personal time, energy, and skills. But man, I, I met my boy over here at the cigar lounge. Uh, so something about both of us, we both love cigars. And as I was actually getting to know him more, um, so he is part of, um, you know, it's 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 pretty special right now to do what you do, photojournalism. It is right. I, I don't think that there's a lot of uh, a lot of companies that are, um, you know, really like. Um, well, you know, why don't you tell us about your industry, man? Because tell us who, like, what you do, how long you've been doing it, all that. Yeah, so uh, I, I've been a photojournalist forever. I graduated from San Jose State with a degree in journalism, concentration photojournalism. Went to work uh, in the Bay, uh, subsequently went to Fresno, worked over there at the Fresno V, and then I came back to work at the Silicon Valley Business Journal. Yeah. So uh, the industry on a whole is, it has been in decline in, in journalism. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. it started like uh, 2008, 2009. And so there are fewer and fewer folks who, who do what I do. And I have a, a unique and, and what I think is interesting skill set. And that is to tell stories visually, to be able to report a story uh, given just basic parameters to, to suss out what is going on and to get images that provide uh, interest and intrigue in a relevant way. It, you know what's interesting about that, though, guys? So uh, probably um, what, what's your Instagram where people can actually see these images at? All right. You can see my Instagram at Zenshack, Z-E-N-S-H-A-C-K. Okay, so if you guys go look at Tomas's photography, this is not like any photography I've actually seen before, right? When I when I saw your style, it you, you have a very interesting way of actually, you know, setting up your subjects. Some of them, sometimes they don't even look set up. Sometimes they're just like you just you just capture that right moment. And like I remember there was like a homeless guy downtown who I saw on your Instagram. I'm like, dude, I see that guy all the time. Yeah. And then you you shot him and it, it looks, you know, it looks super uh, professional, right? So like what how do you get to the point where you know you can you can you know shoot photos that these um you know these these uh news publications essentially uh will want to pay for? Like how do you get to that point? Oh, you know, in high school, I, w I went to high school in Oakland, born in Oakland. That's what's up. And, the town. Uh, hey. The town. That's it. Uh, but I, in high school, I worked at this place called Swan's Market. Mm -hmm. and it was in West Oakland. And it was a hood hood. And I learned there two valuable, well, one valuable principle. And that was to operate in honesty and confidence. And so I've taken that with me wherever I go around the world, locally, and, uh, I use that in addressing my subject. So mm -hmm. I speak honestly uh, mm. and then I operate with confidence. If I need them to do something or if I just want to speak with them, I'll engage. And in that engagement, I'm sizing up uh, the possibilities for a picture. Yeah. And I try to suss out the picture, find out what it is. And I try to come out with the essence of a person, place or event. So that's essence. very important to me. I try to get to the heart and soul of the person and tell their story. And, and I could just see it in them. That's what draws me to them. Mm -hmm. And then I try to bring that out of them. Interesting. So two questions. Have you ever like, uh, have you ever been asked to go do um, a project and then, you know, for some reason you get there and cause you, you mentioned earlier, like honesty, integrity, right? Have you ever been like, yeah, no, I'm not doing this. Yeah. <laughs> tell, tell, tell me about a time when that uh, happened. Let me try to remember. Uh, I can't recall anything off the top of my head. Uh, mm -hmm. 
but I was recently asked to take a picture of a person's residence and mm. uh, was with a drone, and I was just like, yeah, I, think, I don't think I'm going to do that. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I opted not to do it. Okay. Got it. What, what did you do instead? Uh, nothing? Nothing. I just said, yeah. you know, we'll catch you on the next one. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking long term, uh, and, you know, I, I, I enjoy working for the organization, but I think uh, my talents are best used elsewhere. You, you know, that that's that's interesting too, right? Because I think, like, the, the better you get at what it is that you do, the more picky you can actually be with uh, the work you do, right? Um, versus, like, someone who's newer, it's like even if it goes against something that they actually want to do or something they're not feeling, they got to do it anyway. Well, yeah, you, you could also charge more for for what you do, right? Right. Uh, and I turn down jobs uh, based uh, on if they, they don't want to really pay uh, what my images are worth. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you find that those people who know and who value good photography will pay you know a reasonable price for it. Yeah. But uh, you know, it's not about working for free. It, mm -hmm. But if if you really want stories that represent. Uh, your company, uh, the people who work for your company, your company's story. It's so valuable to have something that's honest, something that represents who your people are, their heart and their soul. And not many people can do that, honestly. There, there's very few of us who can. And it's something I love doing. So um, when you are actually going out to do your photo shoots, is there like a written story that you're already reading and you're like trying to shoot photos for that? Or are you creating the story as you go? Well, it's not really a matter of creating. It's a matter of uh, finding out what the story is as I report it visually. Mm. So, for example, I shot last Friday for Los Angeles Times in Paradise, California. Uh, the L.A. Times was doing a story. Uh, similar to what is going on in Lahaina, Hawaii right mm, now. Yeah, yeah. And so they're drawing the parallels between what Lahaina uh, recently went through and what uh, Paradise went through in 2018 during the yeah. campfire. So uh, we're putting our finger on the pulse of the people, the community, for uh, you know how they've come out of it. Uh, are they rebuilding? Are they moving? Uh, who are these people? And so I went there with just basic knowledge. And mm -hmm. uh, I met a reporter there. We interviewed several people, but a lot of it was, you know, driving around. Uh, uh, <laughs> I was having tacos at a, at a taco stand and there, there was a trailer park across the way. And I was like, uh, Anita, uh, let's, let's go drive in that trailer park. I know there's <laughs> gonna be somebody in there. Yeah. <laughs> and we drive in this trailer park and the last trailer, they had a door open. And uh, we went up to the door, we knocked on it, and this gentleman answered without a shirt on. His name was Walt Moon, Moonjar. Mm -hmm. Walt was Walt Moonjar. <laughs> he was he was a little down and out. Yeah, right. Yeah. He he struggled, and he had his home burned in the fire, mm -hmm. and he was given this trailer by I don't know if it was Catholic Charities, but it was a Catholic organization. Mm -hmm. And we spoke with him. And, you know, he told his story, and it was it was uh, unique. It was a, a bit tragic, but you know, uh, I I think it was the same story that a lot of people have told and are telling now, both in Paradise and in Lahaina. Okay, so what, here's what's interesting about what's been going on on social media in regards to Lahaina, right? Mm -hmm. So I um, I will admit I've been pretty busy and I haven't been reading every single article, but you know, I, I, I flipped through Instagram and what's hot right now is Lahaina, okay? Um, and there's people who are, you know, comparing this fire, like saying like, Hey, this, there's no way that this was a mistake. There's no way that, you know, there, there's all kinds of theories that are going out. And also too, um, I have not yet heard of the U S um, government, you know, sending a bunch of support like we have to Ukraine, for example. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what's your take on this as a reporter, man? Do you, do you think that, uh, well, first off, do you think it was an accident? Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, you, you had hurricane force winds mm -hmm. uh, blowing across an island, and all you needed was something to ignite the blaze. And mm -hmm. you know, there's two there's two roads in Lahaina, one in, one out. Yeah. Uh, my sister used to work in, in Lahaina retail there, mm. so I've been there. I've seen it. You know, it, it's old Hawaii. It's uh, <sighs> you know, there's not a lot of development there. That's why people like it. It's rustic. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, unfortunately, they didn't have uh, the necessary safety precautions uh, in place that could avert the catastrophe. But you know, I, I'm sure it was an accidental catastrophe. 
Yeah, because it's it's interesting now where people are saying like, oh, the you know the way that these cars melted and the way that um, you know they're looking at like other natural fires and they're saying like how how are there you know like still green trees here, but if you look at this natural fire, there's no green trees here, and you know all the conspiracy theories are coming out now, right? <laughs> and it's I I'm kind of like you know, and and I hate to say it, man, because. Um, you know, I'm so busy running my company. I have a baby on the way. I got a son in football, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned with what's in front of me, right? And until something like is here in front of me, all I can do is just, you know, uh, listen, maybe talk about it on a podcast like this, maybe. Um, but for the, uh, for the most part, though, do you think that the, the government is, um, you know, from what you know already, do you think that the government is responding aggressively enough or do you think that there's more that they can be doing? Well, I don't know if the government has ever responded uh, uh, in, the, in a proper manner for, for a specific tragedy. I mm. mean, you can go back to Hurricane Katrina. Mm. You can even go to Paradise where I recently was. So they have uh, like 100 miles of private roads and 100 miles of public roads. So in... Uh, their work with what FEMA did in Paradise was they had to cart out all the burned trees, all the burned homes. So they used, you know, large uh, vehicles to do that. So the large vehicles wrecked all the roads I- in Paradise. So right now, if you go there, there's going to be a lot of traffic because they're redoing the roads. If you're when you, if when you, you say large vehicles, like you're talking like what, like 18 wheelers or like excavators and, you know, the l- large uh, uh tractors and okay like and, construction type yes and they're, they're they're going through and just yes they, they just okay. tore up those roads and, okay. and those roads you know they're not great to begin with because it's it's a small little town yeah yeah and so they tore up the infrastructure so the city's rebuilding it now so did fema go back they have some money from fema to deal with that but is did it help with the private roads no not at all you're on your own there yeah yeah so i i, I think the the government response could always be more i, I think uh, you know, if you really do have the people's interests in mind of the United States, then you'll throw you'll throw stuff at it. You'll throw money at it. You'll throw uh, resources that you have to help people out. And right now, I know the people in, in Lahaina uh, are suffering a terrible tragedy. And the best thing that you could do is to help them out in some reasonable fashion. Well, and check this out, right? So to date, uh, let's see, this this is from the Daily Mail. So to date, Biden has approved $8.2 million in assistance to 2,700 households in Hawaii, but critics were quick to compare that to the $12.1 billion in security assistance that has gone to Ukraine. I mean, dude, that that's fucking huge. Like, and, and I, like, I understand that, you know, Ukraine has a war to fight and they need weapons and all this stuff. And, you know, like I, I'm, I don't get in the middle of that, but fuck man. What? Yeah. I, 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 I think that we really need to address, uh, this country and those situations where we can make this country better, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's providing better education, better resources for our community, mm-hmm. we can do much more here. So now, um, I, I want to like rewind a hurricane Katrina. Were you out? Were you out like on ground floor during that? So, uh, I was working at the Fresno B at the time mm-hmm. and our mayor, Alan Autry, uh, who played Bubba on the heat of the night, uh, okay. <laughs> decided which was uh filmed in slidell louisiana so he had a lot of peeps there yeah and so he was offering resources in fresno for people to stay there if they needed to so he went out wow. right after katrina and decided to you know uh help these people out he has a big heart He's a great guy wow and so i went out there with him and a columnist and uh we we're reporting the story and right on the heels of Katrina, Hurricane Rita came along. Mm. So uh, we asked permission, well, I did, uh, to cover the hurricane. And so uh, I slept on the newsroom of a floor uh, uh, in, uh, uh, God, where was it? It was, it was uh, in Louisiana. And we basically just covered the story day by day. Dang. So we... we would try to find gas first and then we'd drive <laughs> to wherever uh, the, the, the hurricane was yeah. about to land. It ended up landed in Lake Charles. 
Yeah. But we would drive. We did some search and rescue with Marines. Wow. Uh, you know, saw alligators uh, swimming down the street. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> That's crazy. So how come, how, like, I had never heard of, so this is the mayor of Fresno. Yeah. I never heard this story. Oh, yeah. Was, did this, did this story even get told at all? Uh only in the Fresno Bay, it didn't make national news. This is this is crazy that uh, you know a mayor has enough power, right? So at least, I, I, how many families did this hop out? I, I I don't have a specific number, but I don't even know if there were that many that took advantage of it because Fresno was you know honestly so far away. Yeah, yeah, from, yeah. from Louisiana. But I I think it was the gesture. Yeah, yeah. That he had, he, he, you know, when he walked around uh, Slidell. You know, we we walked in neighborhoods and there were cars upside down. We'd walk by a trailer park and it looked like somebody threw dice. You know, they were just rough and tumbled. Uh, they were, you know, tractor trailers on their sides. Yeah. And people would come up to him and they'd go, Bubba, Bubba, <laughs> how you doing, Bubba? <laughs> people just loved him. They yeah. just loved him. Man, that's that's a crazy story. So so you were like, uh, so when you were out there, like the hurricane's still going. Yeah. So we were we were out there every day. And eventually it made landfall in uh, St. Charles. And so uh, went out in the hurricane, 70 mile, five mile an hour winds, cameras got all wet. And uh, it was, it was really fun. I really <laughs> enjoyed it. See, and you know, so here's, here's something that's crazy, man. Like, so you're a photojournalist. Yeah. Right. And there, there's probably people out there, like you, you said, it's, it's a dying industry, but do you think that the interest uh, is dying along with it meaning like uh you know do you think that people who are going to college who want to learn a profession do you think that their interest is dying or do you think just the industry alone people paying for i i think it's people paying for it because you know yeah. there's still journalism courses all over the country yeah uh and you know they're still cranking out journalism right uh uh graduates but uh i think people willing to pay for it are fewer yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Right. So, and, and, um, we, we had like talked about this kind of briefly before where like now, um, I feel like, you know, your, your skill set now, what other people have this skill set, um, they're using it to like create YouTube channels and cover stories on their own. They're saying like, sure. you know, fuck the journal, fuck the B, fuck the times, fuck all you guys. Yeah, please don't fuck the journal. <laughs> <laughs> it's, where, uh, it's where I work. Uh, uh, we, we, sanct. We, we like the journal, but, um, <laughs> But my point is that they're they're basically saying like, okay, well, you guys won't take us. We'll take we'll just have to do it on our own. And you know, like a story like Lahaina, right? Now somebody independent is probably flying over there, getting ground floor, getting footage, doing these interviews, um, you know, getting all the all the photos done and writing their own story, creating their own YouTube videos, getting the views, and then getting money from ad spend. Now, sure, right? sure, that, that's a unique way in a democratic form of of doing this position. Yeah. But, uh, God, it, as someone who's been through it for, for a lot of years, I've had the advantage of covering so many different types of uh, things uh, that a newspaper covers. Mm -hmm. So I've shot food, I've shot sports, I've shot spot news, I've done portraiture, I've done photo stories, I've done, uh, you know, literally uh, uh, groundbreakings, <laughs> fun stuff, uh, or spot news, you know, shootings, uh, uh, mm -hmm. and, and different situations as such. But... Uh, when you go into a situation, if you already have a skill set, there's a definite advantage to that in that you know where to go, who to speak with, mm -hmm. uh, where to press, where not to press, uh, mm -hmm. whom to ask, whom not to ask. And it's really an advantage in, in storytelling because yeah. you, you can you can get to it right away. That's interesting because like I, f I feel like at this point now you, we can drop you in the middle of anything. And literally, I could drop you in the middle of an event happening downtown San Jose or an event happening in somewhere in Germany, and you'll figure out a way to put a story together. Yeah, it's something I really enjoy doing. And, uh, you know, it's like going shopping, right? <laughs> you, you go to the market and you, and you need some breads and uh, you some milk, some eggs, some vegetables, some fruit. You know, the same thing when you're out taking pictures, you, you need... You know, and overall, you need uh, something close up. You need something storytelling. Uh, and there's all these different aspects to a specific story. And uh, I'm constantly doing a mental inventory when I'm on a shoot, trying to come up with, well, what, do, what don't I have next? And I, I try to have honest conversation with myself and try to, you know, come up with everything because I, I don't want to leave uh, an assignment 
with any questions in my mind about mm. my about my coverage and the images that I have. I won't leave it until I feel like I have it. Yeah. So did you know that uh, only 12.9% of photojournalists are Latino? Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I was a member of National Press Photographers Association, and then I was a part of California Press Photographers Association. I was a clip chair for that for a number of years and competed in both those contests. And I met a lot of the, the photojournalists in the state of California and then met a lot nationally. Why, why do you think that is though? Like what, cause uh, almost 67% are white. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, economic privilege. Because you think, you think like access to cameras and education or like what? Yeah, I, I believe that's it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you're Latino growing up, I don't know if you have, you know, specifically any role models in, in journalism, let alone photojournalism. Mm. And it's not until you till you really uh, investigate who's doing what and where and have a passion for that thing, you'll discover who's who. But uh, until then, you know, it's just something very general. I mean, you may come in contact with, with reporters uh, uh, on TV, but you know, generally that's people's exposure. Uh, quite often people don't see photographers uh, out and about. You'll see them on the sidelines of uh, sporting events, but usually out in the community, you know, it, 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 we're very few and far between. You know, but you know, there's something special about that, right? Because like even, even in my industry, so I, I own a virtual assistant company. I don't know of any other Latinos that own a company, mm-hmm. like, um, especially not ones that are doing business in, the, uh, in Asia, right? You will obviously find Latino, um, owners that are in Colombia and Mexico cause that, you know, they're freaking Colombian Mexican, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> But there's, you know, the, the people in, in my, and also too, for the longest time, I noticed that there was a point in time where I looked at my clientele and I was like, dang, very white and Asian. There's no Latinos. Hmm. And what you said earlier is so important, right? There's no role models. Mm-hmm. No, like I, I don't have anybody to look up to, right. Or anybody who was accessible to me, mm-hmm. um, that I could just go to and ask for questions. Like, uh, you know, and, and I'm imagining like now, you know, uh, like, a, a son with his dad who's got a camera right and and he's taking him out to show him how to use the settings and you know dude i you know it's funny I, I i got into photography uh photography for a bit and the person who taught me photography was asian and like nowadays actually and we last night we went to go do a maternity shoot um for my girlfriend who's pregnant and it, it was cool that like that girl she's she's actually latino and she uh, she actually put a post up last night that I saw that said, that showed her scrolling through her, um, her her photos and saying this is amazing that it's all people of color on here right. Mm. But uh, but man, there's that's that's really interesting. So how how can we get photography to be more popular in the Latino community, man? How do we do that? That's a really good question. Yeah, uh, I think we could speak at schools, and uh, I have spoken at different journalism programs, uh, both at high school, colleges, junior colleges, and that is a good way to get people uh, interested in it. Uh, I try to refer people, uh, if someone has a son or a daughter and uh, they're interested in journalism, I try to connect them with people that I know because I have a lot of contacts. Mm -hmm. So if they're Hispanic, I'll try to connect them, well, regardless of of their ethnicity, I'm just trying to help people get to the next level. So that's, that's really interesting. So, so you said that you've spoken at schools before. Yes. Right. Um, so can you, uh, can you actually like give us some examples, like when you have been uh, invited to go speak? Yeah. I spoke at Fresno state's journalism department a number of times, uh, and then some high schools in the Fresno area as well. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But, and what is it like when you're out there speaking to the, to these students? So like, it's really fun. Yeah. <laughs> they, they have that youthful energy and then, you know, inevitably uh, I'll show them my images and people will have questions about, well, how did you do that? How did you feel when that person was shot and, and you're photographing them or yeah. you're at a police standoff and you're photographing this trauma yeah. or, you know, I, I photographed this, this, uh, tragically a child was killed by this ice cream truck driver, right? And he, he's like sitting on this curb 
and he has his his hands over his eyes and he's you know his head's down and you know i saw this moment happening and there was a police officer approaching him and i had my camp my you know cam- camera in my face facing the viewfinder waiting for this moment to happen i knew it was going to happen so the police officer just reached down to put his hand on the gentleman's shoulder and it was this physical gesture of, yeah. of the compassion and i was able to take the picture and you know it's a picture that asks questions but also provides a lot of answers yeah. and it provides the, the the component that i think we all relate to mm. a, as human beings and those are the type of pictures that are transcendent and iconic and people relate to and so when i'm in a classroom and they see a picture like that you know instantaneously there's there's a reaction to it that's okay the way that you're describing this right because the, I, I feel like that the photo shows the photographer's intention Right, because you you could have um, not taken that photo at that moment. You could have um, you, you have a you have a choice of you know capturing moments in different times, right? Because I, I feel like a lot of people who are um, you know in news like they want things to look chaotic a lot of times. They want things to be negative, um, and because negative negative we know that negativity sells. Ne- negativity captures attention, right? But when I and, and it's interesting that you talked about the emotion with your photos because when I look at your photos, um, when I when I look at your photos, man, you can you just feel it. Like, so how how did you get to that point where you're like actually drawing out emotion? And also, is that something that's just like naturally in you? Because I don't feel like everybody has that same uh, I don't know, same gift. I'll call it a gift, man. Yeah, I I I don't mean meet many people as well who have that same uh, functionality that I have, but I, I love people. Uh, I love, uh, you know, Steinbeck, John Steinbeck's one of my favorite authors and I love the way he presents humanity. And so I, I just love humanity and in, in the most basic aspects, dude, see, like I'm, I'm look, I'm looking at this photo that you took. This, this is, uh, what was his name again? Walt moon, moon jar. You, you know, dude, there's so many different, I'm looking at this photo. There's so many different ways that you could have taken this photo. And I, I, when I'm looking at this man, like my heart just kind of sinks a mm-hmm. little bit because like, yeah. I feel like I, I don't know this guy, but I can understand his situation when I'm looking at this photo. Yeah. 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 <laughs> he, he's definitely, uh, on the downward side, side of life. And, uh, He's having a difficult time, but, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting when, when we went up to Walt's trailer, the reporter knocked on the door and I saw him get up and, to answer the door and there's a screen door in front of him. Uh, and I very quickly just pushed my camera on focus, did not put the camera in my viewfinder. I just raised it to where I thought it needed to be. And I started shooting. So I think I shot three frames. Wow. So it was really quick, almost instinctual, yeah. uh, but uh, I knew I had it. It was it was just uh, it's something I felt more more than I saw. Yeah. Oh man, what a what a gift, dude! What, oh, thank what, you. What, what a thank gift! You. What a gift! What a uh, like I'm I'm serious. Like I mean, like okay, how do you? So the, the go over this photo right here. So Daniel Corona, Anthony Tiggs, and Henry Luga of downtown street teams. <laughs> They, yes. look, they look like superheroes, man. <laughs> yeah, that that was that was a lot of fun. Uh, actually, I met these gentlemen uh, over near the Guadalupe Parkway. Yeah, and uh, they basically are people who have uh, been through some type of program and are hired by the city, uh, you know, to do cleanup. Mm-hmm. And so when I met them, I saw them uh, in this locale, and I'm looking for a location that would properly tell the story and capture something about their personalities. So we started walking down this path and I saw the way the light was hitting them from behind. You know, quite often you know, the, the normal rule for photography is have the sun at your back, but I like to break rules and uh, I put the sun in front, uh, behind them, facing towards the camera and then brought my camera down a little bit and I, I used a, a, a wide a, angle lens. Yeah, it's a wide and then I used a, 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 a soft box to illuminate them from the front and had them presented, you know, kind of uh, superhero fashion, yeah. one, in, one in front, two on the side, kind of bowling ball, <laughs> uh, bowling pin set up. But uh, I just uh, was able to in- 
just in a very quick period of time, get something that was real from each of them. Yeah, man, that's that that's awesome, guys. Seriously, if you're listening to this, go go check them out. Zen Shack on Instagram. Um, you know, y- y- we were at the cigar lounge and you were telling me um, I can't remember the name of the CEO, but um, and, and what's interesting, too, is like, dude, we're, we're you're taking photos of someone who's down and out at a trailer park and you're taking photos of freaking CEOs that are running on a multi-million you know, bigger than we can comprehend companies. Right. Yeah. And, and you're able to capture emotion and, uh, you know, just tell a story with the photo on both and pretty much everything in between. Right. So th- there was a CEO who you were shooting and you were like, dude, that they, they, you told me that you have like very limited time with them. Like, can you, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I'm trying to, I, I can't remember the gentleman right off the bat, but I, I remember going to his, to his house and, uh, Oh, it was uh, uh, Borders. Okay. Lewis Borders. And so I was photographing him and, you know, very nice gentleman, very nice house. And, you know, he, he t- lets me know I have 15 minutes. And so, you know, that's, I, I, I usually get 30, but I'm, I'm going, okay, <laughs> I, I could work with whatever confines to get, get what I think I need. Yeah. So I, I start speaking with him and uh, basically when I, when I converse with somebody, I try to find some common interests. Yeah. And I have a lot of interests and have a lot of knowledge about these specific interests. And so, you know, I'm, I'm quick talking uh, and, you know, honestly having a, a good conversation with him and I could tell the clock's ticking. So, you know, I'm moving, I'm thinking about what I need, how I need to adjust my light all while having the conversation. Yeah. And, and so I, I respect people's time, but at the same time, I'm trying to get something that's interesting. Hmm. And uh, I was able to do so, you know, a short amount of time. He's very gracious. I appreciate the time he, he, he provided for me. But I always try to stretch it out. If I can get something a little bit, uh, get a little bit more time, then I feel like I've exhausted uh, all these different ideas that come up to me right yeah. away. Because, you know, uh, there's always ideas that come up based on the environment, based on the person, based on the lighting. And so I'm always making these decisions about how to come out with the most aesthetically pleasing possibility thereof. Mm -hmm. And so that's a process. Sometimes it's like sketching on a sketch pad. You you take a couple pictures, you see something you kind of like, you got to move, adjust the light, move around again, but you always got to keep it moving. And and all of a sudden you you see magic and you're just like, oh, Jesus, (laughs) (laughs) I love this. I love this. I'm excited. Yeah. And and then when you're there, you're like, oh man, I did it. I did it. I feel good about that. Are are you, are you a introvert, extrovert? Are you in the middle? Uh, I don't know. I'm one of 11 children. Uh, uh, I'm one of them. I'm right in the middle. Okay. So I was raised by wolves. Uh, just kidding, fam. <laughs> just kidding, fam. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> if you see this. Uh, but uh, yeah, I enjoy people, but at the same time, I, I, I can enjoy quiet. See, and that's something that um, that's something that I noticed about you, right? Because I, 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 we met at the Cigar Lounge, and there's people who treat the Cigar Lounge very differently, right? Mm-hmm. There's some people that go specifically to go socialize, right? Yeah. It's where they go and uh, kind of fill their cups, right? Yeah. But you, 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 you socialize, yes, but majority of the time I see you, I always see you outside, mm-hmm. like on a, you know, on the patio. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter if it's fucking hot, cold, don't matter. Like I've seen you like literally like it's been hot as shit and like you're just like the sun's like blaring on you, but you're just like <laughs> headphones focused. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and there's, there's a, you know, so this is why I asked you like, uh, if you're an introvert, extrovert, right? Cause I'm, I'm so curious. Well, I, I like to have interesting conversations with interesting people. Hmm. So I will listen to the words that come out of people's mouths. And if I find them interesting, I, I will engage. If I don't find them interesting, I won't. Okay. So, uh, you know, I don't judge anybody. Yeah. I just listen. Yeah. And if I find a, a person who has something interesting to say, I'll engage them. And I've met some fascinating people there. <laughs> and other people, uh, I, I just choose not to engage. And, and I believe my, my time is so important, yeah. right? It, I think each of our time is, is very important. And then, you know, I just listen to the universe as well. Yeah. Some, some, <laughs> like there was one cat there who sh- showed up at the shop. It, you know, he's a raggedy looking guy. Right. And uh, not not the norm there. And so he, he was talking about some music thing. 
And so I struck up a conversation with him and found out, you know, he was a musician. I shoot music. I'm a staff photographer at the Monterey Jazz Festival. I've been doing that for over a decade. So we had this great conversation about music, and I was just, like, so intrigued by it yeah, it, yeah. it and felt richer for it. Interesting. So here's here, – because I'm, I'm trying to, like, break down the, you know, the traits, right? Without you having to tell me, I'm trying to, like, you know – I'm trying to figure you out in terms of like what's made you successful so that we can teach other people how to be like you. Sure, right. Sure. If I was to break it down into some traits. So there's a, you know, one of the skills that you, um, that you actually put out, right? So you're, you're talking while getting, you know, when you were talking about the CEO earlier, you're talking while getting him set up. So it's essentially like you've learned how to disarm people, which last night I, I don't like getting photos taken of me. I hate it actually. And I think most people share that sentiment. <laughs> They do. <laughs> it's akin to going to having a root canal done. <laughs> yeah. Because people right away say the, the, the first thing they tell you is I hate having my photo taken. Right. So you have and, and something that, um, you know, that our photographer did last night was she calmed us and she disarmed us. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, but the way that you're describing it, right, you're 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 disarming people by finding common interest. Right. So wh where did you learn this skill? Like, you know, cause I don't think that this comes naturally for just anybody. Hmm. That's a good question. I, I, I think over time I learned it, uh, because initially in my career, I had a difficult time with it. Hmm. And so it's something that I worked on being able to, uh, try to have a conversation with everyone, not to judge anybody, but to take person at face value, mm -hmm. uh, try to find something in common with them. And for me, that has uh, overcome barriers, you know, whether, you know, I come from Oakland and, and we <laughs> yeah. didn't have a lot of money yeah. and, you know, I, I can speak with people who have wealth and privilege and uh, listen to their ideas and what they have to say and let them know that as a person, I care about them. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's paramount, you know, just letting people know that you're intentional uh, that you have no nefarious intent, uh, that, you know, here, here's the goal we have. We want to get a great picture of you, yeah. right? How can we get there? How can we get there? And so most people want to go for that ride, right? right? They, they don't want to go on the bad photo train because they, <laughs> they, they yeah. want to look good. They want to uh, provide something that's not fake, yeah. but something that's honest and interesting. And when you, you know, a lot of times I'll show people the image on the back of the camera, and if they're not crying they're, and they're laughing, then I, <laughs> then I know we've done okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. That, that's, that's awesome. Because, you know, th that skill, I, I, I paid a, a lot of money to learn that skill mm. that, you know, of uh, disarming people. Right. Yeah. Like, um, so, cause I, I originally, when I was younger, I was an introvert. Uh -huh. um, I very much like stuck to myself. I don't like to talk. I was yeah. always in my head. And then, um, you know, I, I got my first job knocking on doors, doing sales, right? Like yeah. first legit job because I, I used to sell weed and stuff. But, you know, like <laughs> that, at that job, like I learned how to be an extrovert. Sure, and, and, then, sure. and then I think over time I was like, oh, you know, I'm actually naturally an extrovert. I'm just not scared yeah. anymore. But the when I say I paid a lot of money to learn that skill, um, I literally like went to training. Uh -huh. Um for to understand people's personality like sure. i didn't go to college i didn't go do any of that but um the lady who who teaches that training her name's danny johnson and uh it's called first steps to success hmm. and it's it's no you know it's no shocker that first steps to success they're teaching you about people mm -hmm. right yeah. uh, and they're teaching you like formulas on how to talk to people right mm -hmm. so one formula it's called um uh, form, right? So it's like, if you don't know how to, how to strike up a conversation with somebody, you can just follow that formula, which F stands for friends and family, right? Mm -hmm. right? So uh, yeah. Tomas, you have friends and family in the area or, yeah. or whatever, you know, whatever you can start off with that. Like, um, you know, <laughs> fuck, I'm fucking up right now. But anyways, <laughs> the next one's occupation, right? Cause anybody can have a conversation around what do you do? Yeah. And most people love talking about what they do. Yeah. Right. Uh, and if you don't love talking about what you do, maybe somebody hates what they do. Then the next thing is recreation. Right. Yeah. So what do you, what do you like to do? Right. When you're not working, not sure, with your sure. friends, not with your family. And the last one, the M, uh, depending if you're using it in a business context or personal context, but it's either money or message. Right. Okay. But, um, you know, so that's like, I, I, I had, and, and it's crazy to think that like I paid for what now feels like basic skills, like how you're describing it. Sure, you're, sure. just, you're just, you're describing this like in a way where it's just like, 
so natural. It'd be like a fucking Jedi. You know? it, it's funny because <laughs> I use all of those. <laughs> yeah. See, and, and, You're going down the list. I, I literally use all of those. See, so, and then you, you pick this skill up just through, you know, through life. Right. But, um, you know, so the, the next, the next thing that, uh, that I, that I noticed, like you, you said, break the rules. Yeah, definitely. Break the, break the rules. Definitely. So, you know, like one of the biggest rules is the, the rule of thirds, man. Yeah. You, you break that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Sometimes, uh, uh, you know, you, you, I've exposed myself to a lot of different photographers and I have, uh, top photo classes, uh, mostly, uh, I've taught some in Morocco and in India and that I've done personal classes, but, uh, you know, if you're going by rules, that's a good starting point. Yeah. And then from there, you really have to go where your interest takes you where you know you get in touch with this creative part of yourself and you really have to listen to that and mm. like i literally have interior conversations and fortunately the conversations most of the time are interesting <laughs> but what i try to do is to say to myself you know okay here we're at the start of this picture where is it going if i if i use the rule of thirds okay that's cool but what if I try this? What if I try that? And I'm not really not looking at, at the rules per se, but I'm going by, you know, part intuition, part uh, uh, repetition, what I've done before. Uh, and then uh, I go where I'm led with the image and with my subject mm -hmm. and try to come back with something that's most interesting. And then, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, people don't like a wide angle lens and I'll use it. <laughs> and and, and yeah. try it and see if it works. Yeah, other yeah. times I'll, I'll use a 50 uh, and, you know, other times a telephoto. But it's just whatever is right for the specific subject. Are you, I'm actually kind of curious now, are, what, what kind of, uh, what kind of body are you rocking nowadays? So I shoot with a, a Sony mirrorless. So I have an A7R4, A7R3. Wow. Yeah, you, you, you know what's interesting, man? So a lot I, I've met like some pretty OG photographers, and mm -hmm. a lot of them like stick with like the uh, like the old school bodies. Yeah, uh, you know uh, when I I shoot Canon as as well. Yeah, and, and when I was shooting Canon and uh, specifically in uh, journalistic endeavors and enterprises, uh, the DSLR was so fast and functional. Mm -hmm. And so if something was happening in front of me, the camera was ready to capture it as quickly as I was ready. Mm -hmm. And so there wasn't a lot of hit or miss. Now with a digital mirrorless camera, it's slower. And mm. so you have to get your camera on and uh, there's a little bit of a lag sometimes and you have to understand uh, the machinations of the camera, its functionality and make it work for you. It has you know, a certain quirkiness. It's a little slower, but it has such great quality Yeah, with, 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 uh, the megapixels that my camera has, uh, the, the image quality is just, what, it's incredible. Which, which body is it? A seven R four. A seven. And then I use the, the Sony G master lenses and they're sharp edge to edge. Yeah. And I didn't find that true with other manufacturers. Well, dude, the, the amount of information now that those cameras are getting inside of the photo is fucking crazy. Right. And also I know that helps you as well, like in the editing side too, right? Cause the more information there's on the photo, the more you can manipulate it after the fact. Right. Well, it, it looks sharper because there's more information, right? There's more detail. And so, uh, as far as being edge to edge sharp, it gives you more contrast. It gives you uh, a better aesthetic. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, <laughs> out of focus is is in if it's intentional, it's cool. <laughs> if it's not, it's uncool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so I I want to I want to start getting into like some uh, some practical advice, right? So like now I'm gonna I'm gonna ask like the mentor and you to come out. Right. Sure. Sure. Um, and so we, we have about like 15 more minutes on this episode. And, um, I really, I really am curious, right? Like what, if I am a, someone who's graduating from a journal program 
and any college across the U.S. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'm knowing I'm going into this because I think I'm, I'm passionate about it. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm passionate about photography. I'm passionate about telling stories. But there's, you know, let's just say somebody in their local market, like they're just not hiring right now. Mm-hmm. Right. How do you how do you set yourself up to eventually get an opportunity to work at some, uh, you know, one of these uh, publications? Well, I, you know, when I first came out of journalism school, my portfolio wasn't great. And I would go to you know different photo editors and interview with them. And I realized <laughs> that my portfolio wasn't great. I knew exactly why it wasn't great. And I was like, Ugh. yeah, it, it was kind of you know, catch 22. I needed yeah. to have great pictures and I knew they, they were in me. I just hadn't had the experience of making them yet. Mm. So what I had to do was go to different events, start telling stories on my own that I, that I have passion about, that I'm interested in, that I have access to. And once you start kind of getting dirty with that, getting involved with that, then you're going to come up with the, the images that reflect, one, your capability of telling a story. They're going to tell the person who you are. They're going to tell the person about your interest. They're going to tell the person uh how articulate you are with this uh medium Mm -hmm. and that i believe is what's going to connect you with somebody who will see they'll see something in your portfolio and they go oh i see that i can relate to that there's some raw stuff there but i think if i give this person an opportunity then they will succeed you you know what's crazy about that right because um so so uh getting a job is is just one route Right. Um, and so, so some people like if, if you just can't get a job, you got to figure out a way to make money. And uh, that. yeah, and another way is just selling your services straight up. Right. right. So I think yesterday, you know, I, I felt like the price was really good for what we paid. I think uh, we paid like what, six, six hundred eighty bucks. Yeah, so 680 bucks uh-huh. uh, for the photo shoot. And uh, we actually just got the photos this morning, right? But what you're talking about there is immediately like the moment that uh the moment that lolo actually i saw her in the surf <laughs> she was <laughs> taking a wave away for the team i like that <laughs> yeah man and, and, the, and the moment that she saw like the the photographer style right mm-hmm. like i would I w- you could just tell like you know the, these photos that she took of us are pretty much the same exact style that she has like on her instagram right so mm-hmm. immediately like we were like called to that style and it's sure, like okay sure. that's well not me she she chose because i told you i hate photos but <laughs> i know that it's like important now right but she delivered the style right right so so you're saying that this this portfolio is is not just because i think when people think of a portfolio they think of just like okay here's all the photos i've taken but what you're, though I feel like the way you're describing a portfolio is to like craft an experience to help people understand like what it is that you can actually do. Oh, it has to be curated. Curated, curated. Absolutely. Okay. It, it, it's like you're having a show at a museum. Like I, I've, show, I've had okay. shows at, at different places, right? And so, you know, uh, one was at uh, a music place down at down Santa Cruz, uh, Kumba, a jazz center. And I had a music show, uh, music photo show there. And so the images I curated were relative to that. It mm. was photos that I've taken at different concerts and the Monterey Jazz Festival. Do you have different portfolios depending on who you're, who you're talking to? Well, if you go to TomasoValle.com, you'll find I have different areas. So I shoot music. I shoot uh, a lot of medical stuff. I shoot a lot of sports stuff. So I have different areas that would reflect my capabilities. I have food on there. Uh, I have a lot of different portraiture. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I will curate what I'm showing a client based on what the interests are, what the need is for the specific purpose. Pay attention, people. Pay attention, right? This is good. I like this because, uh, you know, this, this right here is like a... <sighs> Sometimes common sense is not so common, right? Like yeah. to, to me, yeah. like what you're when you're telling this to me, I'm like, okay, I get it. But also, like I've I've uh, I have seen photographers also like just spew everything. Like they'll just put like all their best shit like in one, but it just doesn't, you know, it doesn't doesn't click, right? Um, 
So I so now let, let's just say that a photographer listened to you. They're like, okay, here's my portfolio. I curated it. Here's the different style that are, styles that I like shooting. I like shooting babies. I like shooting food. I like shooting this. Right? Okay. Boom. Yeah. So now, how does so you also do independent shoots too? Yes. Right. Um, so how do you price yourself? I price myself whatever the market will bear. So uh, if I shoot in the Bay Area, I charge more. If I shoot in the Central Valley. I charge less, but it just depends on the client and the relationship I've had with him over the years. So one of my favorite clients that I work with uh, in the Central Valley is Kaiser Permanente, mm. and they've been a great client uh, over the years. And I charge them fairly, but uh, you know it, it's an honest way; it's not cheap. Yeah, yeah. But what we have together is like I've been working with this one lady specific, Mer- Meredith uh, Marilla. I've been working with her for over a decade, and we have this great relationship with the other, with each other. We're communicative. We let each other know we're on the same plane. We talk about images as we're making them. We show each other. You know, she'll look at the images, and we'll have a dialogue about it, and uh, it's all positive. Yeah. And so, as a result of that, uh, you know, they don't have to go anywhere else. They don't, they don't have to pay less or pay more. They have something that they're comfortable with. They have a, a known commodity. So if you could provide a known commodity to a person, man, that's what they want. They they don't want a hassle. They they don't, <laughs> they don't want any barriers to come between what they need, right? And if you could provide a service, have fun with it, make them feel good about it. And I'm not saying put up with with bad behavior, but I'm saying you know find something positive and work with that. And uh, you know I I always have a good time when I'm shooting, and my subjects. Uh, you know, 99% of the time have a good time as well. And I provide that opportunity for them to share in that experience. Do, do you charge per photo? Do you charge per session and get in, and guarantee amount of photos? Does, does it depend who you're working with? Like how does that Yeah, work? it depends who I work with. Uh, I, I don't really, I, I do a, a project basis okay. and try to figure out, you know, uh, how much time will be involved. Uh, some shoots involve more Photoshop work. Yeah. Uh, and so I take all that into consideration, but I, I, you, you can't really put yourself on a, on a per photo basis or hourly basis or even a day rate sometimes because, you know, that really doesn't equate with the amount of time that you put into and, you know, experience that you have, because, Mm -hmm. you know, you, if you charge someone per hour, you know, if Leonardo da Vinci charged per hour, uh, when he was first starting off, it, it, you know, when he became a great master, would he still be in the same ballpark? No, he, he'd be paying a hell of a lot more because you're, you're paying for that person's eye for yeah. their vision and for the experience. And so you can't really put that on an hourly basis. Yeah, yeah, that's a really great point. Right. So, and, and again, this is just fresh last night, but we were in San Francisco from like at that photo shoot location, mm-hmm. maybe 30 minutes. Right. And she delivered the photos, like literally like when we woke up, they were there. Mm. Right. And I'm not even mad. I actually probably would have paid more because I know that like just understanding a little bit about photography, she probably has LUTs that she's created, like, you know, of her, her style. She probably has like a lot of these things that she's made over time. right? Right. And because of that, we get to get like, the, the contract says two weeks. We'll get the photos within two weeks. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, there, there's people who don't understand who have been like, oh, well, it probably took her like, you know, okay, she drove there, drove back, whatever, you know, four hours for this. It was crazy expensive, right? Yeah. But in my mind, I'm like, no, actually, I think she should have charged more because, yeah. Yeah. dude, she fucking nailed it. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. A great, a great, great experience. So how do you meet these clients, man? So like, and, and this, this will be like my last mentorship question, right? So if you're somebody who's new um, and maybe like you're not expecting to get paid top dollar just yet, but you want to develop these relationships over time. How do you even find these relationships like Kaiser, like, you know, these other relationships? I'm have? always looking at every, okay. every conversation. I always have my business cards with me. Uh, I'm always ready. I have a conversation. I was at a club in Fresno. A primarily African American club, just hanging out with my friends, and uh, met this young man there. He, he actually came up to us. He said, "Who, who are you guys?" Because we, you know, we're styling, and uh, <laughs> he wanted to know what's up. And so uh, met this rap rap artist, and said, "You know, we have to take your pictures, man. We just yeah. have to do that." Yeah. And so eventually, I nailed him down. We got some great shots, and then you know, I've done some work with them since. Yeah. And so it's just so, so. Was the first set like? on the house and then like he hired you later 
Yeah, that first set was on the house, and it's something I rarely do, but mm. I, I I knew there were some great pictures there, yeah. and I wanted to provide an opportunity for other artists to see what I could do with mm. someone in the music industry in a portraiture basis. Okay, see, but you know what you just said is really important, right? Especially for someone newer. Okay, like, you know, you right now, like, at the level you're at, especially if, like, you're booked, you're back-to-back, and it's, like, someone's saying, dude, can I, like, fucking squeeze you in for, like, a Saturday morning, please? Like, you know, yeah. you're, you're going to sacrifice something. Like, yeah, dude, the price better be high, right? Yeah. But when somebody's newer, they're still, you know, maybe they have a minimal portfolio. They don't have the relationships. Dude, I, I encourage a lot of free work up front, right? But there, yeah. there has to be a point where, like, you draw a line in the sand and say, right. okay, now... You know, I, I can give you a good price maybe, but eventually like, dude, you got to eat. Right. Yeah. Um, but that's, I feel like now too, like with my podcast and the stuff that we put out a lot of times, you know, people have gotten business through being like in your seat and then we, we put out like videos yeah. and then they get more business because they get the exposure. Like, sure. uh, especially when you say really valuable stuff, it'll go on social media and then, <laughs> Um, yeah, dude, I just have, I, I know for a fact people have gotten business from this and not just myself, right? Awesome. I can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> and, and bring it on, bring it on. Dude. Yeah. Just make sure like when we, when we post them, share, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Like j- just share. And, um, but uh, w- with that being said, I feel like a lot of times with these podcasts is like, we're giving the value up front. Right. You know, right. we're, we're, we're giving, we're giving the value up front. So now, um, let's say that somebody was looking for a mentor. Right. Would you, are you accepting paddle wands right now? What's, what's up with that? Oh man. I, I always have an open door and open ear and, uh, will always have a conversation with somebody. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, especially I, hey guys, uh, secret tip, buy him a cigar. <laughs> <laughs> that's two, that's two hours right there. Maybe. <laughs> well, you know, I was, uh, uh, I met a guy in tech here and he had a, uh, a community event and I met a high school kid at the event and uh, we're at this event right Mm -hmm. and uh, this person from the hood right brother and uh, we're at the event and there were some VPs at this event tech VPs and I I, I said hey look at here go up to that VP and introduce yourself to them and tell them who you are Mm -hmm. so these three kids went up to this VP and the engagement, it was so magic. It was mm-hmm. wonderful because how they were received as a person of color by this VP was a unique experience that they're not going to forget. Right. Yeah. It's not the norm. It's totally out of, out of their box, out of their, their normal uh, exposure. I mean, how many VPs have you met in your life? Not, not a lot, I mean, <laughs> not I, enough. <laughs> I, I, I meet yeah. a ton. And so it, it's normal for me, but for a person who's, who's still in high school to meet someone who's, you know, in this industry making, you know, large dollars and to have a, a great experience through that. I, I think what I, I helped that person do, uh, was open their mind to the possibilities and the access that they can create by being open to another person. Mm. And so this person contacted me, they wanted some help. Uh, they didn't have a LinkedIn page. Cause I said, you know, Hey, you, you gotta be on LinkedIn. This is yeah. how, how you make business connections. Yes. And you have to start your business connections now Yes. in high school before you even, yes, dude, that is such a good fucking point. Yeah. Everybody listen to that. That is like probably the biggest bomb that you dropped. If you're in high school and you're listening to this, it's not too early to go start connecting in a field that you're interested in. So for example, if you want to go into photojournalism, one of the first things that I would do is connect with my peers yeah. or, you know, mentors, right. And start messaging people and being like, yo, Hey, Tomas, uh, I'm a student, very interested in what, uh, you know, what you do. Can I fucking carry your camera bag one day? Just like follow you around. Like that would, sh- uh, but okay, keep going, man. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> no, so, so, uh, with, with that kid, I helped him with the, with this LinkedIn page and, you know, we left it there, yeah. but, uh, I have, uh, done portfolio reviews, uh, mm. um, adapted that. And are, are you nice about it? Or are you, are you kind of, a, well, just, you know, I, I'm a positive person. I always find something positive. I always yeah. start with the positive. Yeah. And then I go from there. But you keep it real because keep honesty it real. and integrity, right? No, that, that's it. Yeah. it, it and so, <laughs> you know, so, some people have left from my portfolio reviews uh, with their head down, but I always give them a ray of hope. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I love that, man. I love that. So I think um, we're we're actually out of time here, right? Oh, so man. We're, yeah, we're right at the end. But um, dude, I think all right. Let's just say that somebody wants to get a hold of you right now. You gave your Instagram earlier. How sure. how else does somebody get in touch with you? Whether they want to do business, mentorship, whatever. Yeah, uh, I would say through 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 my Instagram, uh, Zinchak on IG, and then they could hit me up on on LinkedIn as well. Those are both great ways. Uh, Tomas Ovalle, O V A L L E. Ovalle, Ovalle, Olvera. Where's dude? So I'm sure somewhere right down the line, like That's we're related it. somewhere. Olvera. <laughs> <laughs> but all right, brother. I appreciate you coming through. Um, any last messages that you want to tell everybody? Ah, I just want to say I appreciate Anthony here, Lolo, and I think what you're doing is fantastic because you're uplifting the community. You're providing this connectivity to the community, and we need more of that. And I appreciate yeah. you for doing that. Well, hey, man, I appreciate you for rolling up. Absolutely. Cool.